Good afternoon, everybody. I'm Blakesley Burkhart, and I'm going to be talking about magnetohydrodynamics and a little bit about turbulence and the connection between those two for the next hour and a half. Um, and basically, when I was preparing this lecture, I decided I wouldn't really assume any prior knowledge about plasma physics. Um, so if you've seen a lot of this stuff before, I apologize. Um, hopefully, there'll still be a few entertaining surprises along the way. Um, and I'm, I kind of want to give sort of the ground level picture, especially considering I know a lot of the lectures after me will probably dive into special topics in, in connection to, to plasmas and, and in particular plasma astrophysics. So I'm going to use a little bit of the board and also slides. also wasn't really sure how much to mix that up, but especially after seeing Lewis this morning, I think a few more slides can kind of make your brains relax a little bit. I think my brain needs to relax a little bit after that. Um, so this is a big topic. Both of these topics um, by themselves could be full on graduate courses. Um, so I have 90 minutes. So please forgive me if I don't cover everything. Um, I'm going to try actually not to cover everything. Uh, and, and give just sort of the, the ground level. Um, there's a lot of references um, that could be used uh, if you want to read more about MHD or turbulence. Um, I used um, quite a few. I realized I didn't put one of them down here on this slide. So this one here, so this is magnetohydrodynamic turbulence not magnetohydrodynamics and turbulence. It's both combined. This is a very nice book. Um, the, the author's name is Bizcamp. So that, that book covers quite a bit of, uh, of the basics. Um, a lot of the slides are from uh, my colleague Nick Murphy. He's um, a, a research scientist at Harvard. Um, so he's taught a course very similar to this, um, as well as Ellen Zweibel, who's a faculty at UW-Madison. Um, so, so these lecture notes kind of come from all over the place. Um, and so I'll just jump in. Um, so, you know, all of us are astrophysicists. First, on the most basic level, why should you care about magnetohydrodynamic turbulence? And the, the just um, bottom line answer is that MHC turbulence ends up affecting so many processes that we as astrophysicists study. And I put up a few topics that I'm particularly interested in on this slide here. So, so for example, a problem like star formation, right? So stars form in extremely turbulent interstellar clouds, which are threaded by a magnetic field. We definitely know that from, from um, uh, observational experiments like the Planck satellite, um, that magnetic fields play a dynamic role in the star formation process. And so even though a star forming region is actually a very cold, very dense region, as I'll motivate in my lecture, uh, the plasma approximations can still apply in such a region, in particular for partially ionized plasmas, which actually I won't touch on very much. Um, but nevertheless, you still have this uh, approximations of collisionality between uh, the particles, and the magnetic field still plays a very dominant role because the ions and the neutrals are, are well coupled in such a medium. So then there's more appropriate regions to apply ideal magnetohydrodynamics. So for example, the sun is one such region, and you have a lot of very interesting um, plasma physics happening, of course, in the sun. Um, and I, I actually, on that topic of the sun, I had two possible activities for after the lecture planned for you guys. And one of them was a field trip to the roof to look through a solar telescope to see a real live ball of plasma, which is the sun. Unfortunately, it's raining today. So we'll do that another day. So instead, you get a coding project. Sorry. Um, so many other interesting areas where you cannot ignore magnetic fields and turbulence. So I just list a few here. These are, I think, very exciting areas of astrophysics, which probably many of you doing your, your summer projects, um, some of these areas are definitely touched upon. Um, so the funny thing here is that actually this is not necessarily a popular area of astrophysics, right? So if you maybe talk to observers or other astronomers rather than astrophysicists, uh, people sometimes hate on 
magnetic fields and turbulence. And these are a few quotes that I pulled out of my interactions with people at the IAU meeting a few years ago. And when I was talking about my research on MHC turbulence, these were a few quotes I got. I was sort of offended and shocked that people had these views about magnetic fields and turbulence. So this is, these are actual quotes from astronomers. So magnetic fields are too complicated for our models. They're too numerically expensive, right? So Lewis was talking about all the complications with divergence cleaning and the MHC approximation. So I think this is where this person was going. And yeah, people just don't like turbulence. This, this is something you will encounter in your career if you start to delve into the complications of turbulence and magnetic fields. And this is basically a summary of that. If we don't understand it, invoke magnetic fields. If we still don't understand it, invoke turbulence. This, you laugh, but this, this is really part of our culture. So I think it's important to point out that we actually do need to understand these two processes. OK, so what am I going to try to cover here? I'd like to do some very broad brush overviews of MHD, so the MHD approximation. Um, where can you apply the MHD approximation and where you shouldn't apply it? Um, some different applications of that. And then I'm really lucky because uh, Pascal really did an amazing job on the hydrodynamic front with continuity equation and momentum equation. So I'll show just briefly uh, how those things connect with magnetohydrodynamics, right? So how would you go about putting in the pieces to model correctly a system uh, like a plasma, right? A fully ionized plasma where you need to consider how the magnetic and electric fields are affecting the motion of your fluid. And then I'll get into how, how all those things tie together with turbulence. So I, quite frankly, I might not get to all of that. So we'll just see how it goes. Um, and of course, please feel free to ask, ask questions and, and to stop me. OK, so I kind of touched a little bit that why study plasma astrophysics? Um, you know, if we really think about also not only from the point of view of interesting problems, but also from the point of view of the composition of matter in the universe, most of the baryonic matter, of course, is in this, this plasma state, uh, especially if we just consider the fact that stars are, 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 are plasma, right? And then the interstellar medium is plasma. So very, very little of the matter actually uh, in the universe is in this um, non-plasma uh, neutral state, right? But the funny thing is most of the matter we interact with daily is actually not in a plasma state. Um, magnetic fields play vital roles in astrophysical processes. Um, and interestingly, plasma astrophysics touches on this regime where we often can't really study the things in laboratories. Right? We, can have, we can have some, and I'll, I'll go into that a little bit more, but plasma astrophysics really is taking place in extreme regimes. So extreme scales, extreme densities, extreme temperatures, and it's oftentimes very hard to get at that from the laboratory perspective. Um, and so in this field, oftentimes it's very useful for uh, people who study laboratory physics to talk with people who are astrophysicists and do numerical experiments and also uh, direct experiments. Um, so for example, like the solar wind community, where they make direct measurements in situ of the solar wind plasma. Um, so as I said, there's many applications. I, I, won't, I won't go over that again. Um, and you guys are obviously working on many of these problems. Um, and again, plasma physics is interdisciplinary. So it touches on these many different fields. Um, and I already went through that. OK, so fundamental processes. And this is actually, this slide here I put together because I know these are going to be our lectures for the summer, right? So different, I'm not going to go through all of these uh, areas of, of MHD, um, but waves, shocks, um, so shocks, uh, we already touched on hydrodynamic shocks, but magnetohydrodynamic shocks also have very interesting and different properties than hydrodynamic shocks. Um, so there's, there's definitely more um, to that story. Instabilities, um, et cetera. OK, so plasma is actually, so most people think of a plasma and they think, OK, well, it's, it's a fluid or a, a medium where the temperature has actually gotten so, so hot that you start to separate out the, 
uh, 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 electrons and the ions, and you start to develop a situation in which your fluid has some charge separation. And it can even the total fluid could actually have a net charge of zero, but you have slight separation between ions um, and, and electrons, and you can get into a situation where those two uh, species start to react on each other. Right? So you can imagine that you easily develop a situation in which you can have wave propagation right, from a positive and negative charge, which are back reacting on each other, even though the net charge can actually, of the whole system can be zero. Um, so that's, that's a good sort of uh, description of it. However, you don't necessarily have to have very extreme temperatures to have a plasma. Um, so there's, there's a regime which is called a partially ionized plasma that actually exists even further down here. So this actually is a regime where you have to start considering non-ideal effects of, of the fluid. Um, but it's a regime that very much is important for astrophysics. So like I said earlier, uh, star-forming clouds, uh, very dense, very cold regions, definitely exist further down here. Um, in, in this colder regime at different densities. Um, so here you can see most plasmas, especially in where the ideal MHD limit applies, which would be a fully ionized plasma. So that means, of course, that you don't have a lot of neutral species uh, that are dominating the dynamics and the collisions between the particles. Um, you do have pretty warm medium here. Um, and so this applies to basically all interesting problems related to the intergalactic and interstellar medium, uh, to the solar wind, um, and then even going into uh, the laboratory regime, right? So, for example, uh, fusion experiments mostly operating at reasonably high temperatures, uh, the sun. Um, and when you go very hot, you start to get into relativistic effects, right? So relativistic plasmas. Now, there's some interesting characteristic scales, right? So anytime you go to, you talk about plasmas, there's these interesting characteristic scales, um, which uh, either can be dimensionless, or in this case, I'm showing you here a few particular quantities uh, that describe the plasma um, in terms of basic lengths and, and basic frequencies. So I want to give you a flavor of what these mean. And I already mentioned um, this idea of, you know, once you start separating out charge in, in a fluid, right, you can still have a net zero charge. So imagine you have like a cylinder and you have some positively charged ions and some negative ones that start to separate out. Right, but the overall charge remains zero, right? It remains neutral overall. So there's some very interesting wave properties that can develop in such a system if you were to slightly perturb some of these charges, right? So say I, I perturb the bottom of the cylinder, what will happen to the system as a whole, right? And so you can actually write down the force equation of that. So you have the mass of the individual particles. And you can relate this wave equation, right? So this is, this is just the electric field, right, perturbed on, on some direction x. Um, you can write this in terms of what's called the, the plasma frequency, right? So this is the frequency of oscillation that's related to the perturbation that will be given by the electric field. If I, if I move this charge slightly. OK, so that's the first quantity of interest. And I've got this here. This is this omega here. This is the plasma frequency. And you have a plasma frequency for uh, electrons and protons. So you can write this down. It depends on mass. So that's why it's important to separate those out. The density, the charge, the mass. So this is for the electrons. Um, so 
this, as you can see from, from the slide here, this quantity can be orders of magnitude different for different environments, right? So for the interstellar medium, the intergalactic medium, a tokamak, um, you can have wide ranges of these plasma parameters. Um, so densities, of course, temperatures, I already mentioned on the previous slide. Again, those wide, widely vary for different problems. The plasma frequency, uh, these parameters here in particular are somewhat related to the plasma frequency. This is um, the lambda D is, um, So this is independent of mass. Um, basically, this is the length scale at which in this system the electric field would be screened out. Right? So if I perturb my charges down here, there's some distance. Uh, the Dubai length, which is basically, OK, out to this distance, these guys actually won't feel that perturbation anymore. Right? They've been shielded out by all the other moving charges. Again, that really varies widely for different astrophysical environments. So the point of this is to say that plasma physics is really hard. There's no one you know, numerical code or even one numerical method that can capture all of these different scales, right? Because we're talking about orders of magnitude difference in like the most simple and basic plasma properties. Right, so this, this very simple picture of this charged this cylinder with these charges and how they move, um, this is about as a simple a picture as you can get. And you still could envision a system where you have orders of magnitude um, difference in these different um, basic parameters. Um, OK. So I've been mentioning uh, magnetohydrodynamics. So what is that? So probably most of you already have, have taken a guess at that. So that's just essentially where you take your hydrodynamic equations, your Navier-Stokes equations, and then you couple them with Maxwell's equations. right? And then you get the MHD equations. Um, so MHD as a fluid approximation is valid uh, only in some particular circumstances. And again, it relates back to these basic plasma um, quantities. So one would be where you apply these, these fluid equations, is what I mean. So you take your Maxwell's equations and you couple them to, to Navier-Stokes. Um, one is that a, a timescale argument. So you need to consider timescales longer than, oops, excuse me, than uh, the inverse of plasma frequencies and cyclotron frequencies, right? So Basically, you want to consider a system where your time scale is significantly longer, a time scale of interaction in the fluid is significantly longer than the inverse of the plasma frequency. The other is a link scale argument. So you want to consider link scales much, much longer than this Dubai link scale where you have this shielding. Right? So you need to consider basically systems that are significantly longer uh, uh, time scale wise and length scale wise than the motions of the individual uh, ions and electrons that are moving around in your fluid. Okay, so that's, that's where the MHD approximation would, would apply. Um, there are other uh, sets of equations, like a full kinetic approach that you can take, um, where you would follow the dynamics of individual charged particles in, in a numerical simulation, for example. But that would be a situation where you would not be considering the ideal MHD equations. Um, so a few more uh, aspects of ideal MHD. Um, so considering not just how like waves would propagate in the system, but also direct collisions of particles, you would want to assume that the collisions are frequent enough such that the distribution of particles would be Maxwellian. Um, another assumption of ideal MHD uh, relates to the energy equation, so the equation of state. Um, either you can take an adiabatic equation of state, uh, or you can take an isothermal equation of state. Um, but there's no, uh, 
uh, heating or cooling or dissipation for, for pure ideal MHD. Um, it also assumes the plasma is fully ionized, right? So that right there suggests that, for example, my star formation example I was talking about earlier, um, the ideal MHD equations may not be a good approximation there, right? So the, in star forming regions, the plasma should be um, mostly, mostly neutral, actually. So then you would want to uh, consider the dynamics of a partially ionized medium. Um, and then, of course, this ideal MHD, there's nothing related to quantum mechanics or relativity um, or any sort of um, uh, dissipative effects. So that's what, when people say ideal MHD, this is what they're talking about, right? So these, these basic assumptions. So the time scale is longer than the plasma time scales, the link scale is longer than the plasma link scales, and collisionality, the equation of state being very simple, and the plasma fully ionized. So how many of you think we often have those things, uh, those conditions met in the real world? Not very often, right? So um, especially if you're trying to study very small scale processes or if your system is something like a tokamak um, where you, know, you don't have a very long, you don't have very large systems or very uh, long time scales to study your plasma processes over. Um, and, and yeah, there's many, many interesting situations where you can imagine that a lot of these things don't apply, right? So another one might be planetary disks where you need to consider non-ideal terms in your equations or you need to consider uh, viscous terms. Um, so this is to say, like, when you see the ideal MHD equations in a paper, and there's many, many papers that use these assumptions, you should always be thinking, ah, but what about the non-ideal effects, right? What about um, all these other interesting aspects that may be affecting the problem that you're not including? Okay, so yeah, I mentioned, I mentioned basically these. Oh yeah, so this is actually good. Systems where you can often use MHD. So the solar wind actually ends up being reasonable. Uh, the heliosphere, the magnetosphere, those are really great um, places if you think about it, because not only can we study them numerically and theoretically, but we can also take in situ measurements with spacecraft. Right? So there's spacecraft taking direct measurements of the magnetic field, the electric field, uh, the velocity, the density, uh, and then you can compare with, with how how your uh, equations and how your code are, are holding up under these approximations. Um, okay, and I mentioned where it's not useful already. All right, so what about the equations? Well, the good news is you've seen a lot of these equations before. Um, the continuity equation, right? So that's basically nothing has changed um, with that. We're still considering the conservation of, of mass. Uh, and you have both the time dependent change for the density as well as the evective term, um, which actually I, I know you guys saw all of that yesterday, but I have a, a couple funny sort of intuitive uh, examples for that that I might, I might show you. Um, the momentum equation, so now, of course, the momentum equation is not just um, acting on some fluid of density rho, but actually we also have the fluid um, momentum altered by the effects of the magnetic uh, field or, or the influence of the charged motions. And so then we need to bring in, that's where Maxwell's equations already start to enter. Um, and so in our momentum equation, we get this J cross B term. And depending on your units, uh, you would divide by C here. Um, and so where those terms come from, of course, all come from, you start to bring in the Maxwell's equations, um, Lewis mentioned the divergence constraint, which has been a big pain in the butt for numericists. Um, and then Faraday's law and Ohm's law enter uh, in order to uh, write down how the dynamics of the magnetic field are changing with time, right? In particular, that's Faraday's law. So you need some way of quantifying not only how uh, 
the fluid is changing with time, right? From your continuity and your momentum equation, but you also need to bring into the fact that the fluid moving brings in to play this time-dependent magnetic field, right? And that's where Faraday's law comes in. So, you know, the continuity equation was covered yesterday um, quite in, in, in a really great way, so I don't really want to go through it again. Uh, just to suffice to say that this advective term, I think, is the one that trips most people up because it's not quite intuitive. Um, so for, for a fluid, right, we have, we have this not only the time-dependent term, but also the spatially-dependent term. Whereas if you imagine a flow going through a pipe and this spa the spatial dimensions of the pipe change, then the flow can be faster here and slower here, right, as the pipe is expanding. So this is actually just purely a spatial effect um, related to the advection. And I, I saw um, Nick, Nick showed this example of uh, advection in the form of uh, an I Love Lucy episode. So this is Lucy and her friend and they have to wrap chocolate. So the chocolates are coming down this conveyor belt, and they have to wrap them. And if they don't wrap them, then they get fired. And so I think this, uh, Nick Murphy showed me this as an excellent example of the advection term in the continuity equation. So the chocolates are coming out. So imagine these chocolates are your particles, and they are coming out with maybe a time-varying speed, but they also can come out spatially varying, right? So sometimes the chocolates can be moving faster if the conveyor belt moves faster, but then they can also be spaced differently. And so that, the, <laughs> so the continuity equation here very much applies. Uh, so, so the spatial and, and also the velocity can change. They're doing their best to conserve chocolates but failing. Okay, so hopefully that gives you a little more intuition about, about that term. Okay, and flux, of course, again, this is Nick. <laughs> flux, flux oftentimes is, can be a little bit tricky, but if you just remember density times velocity, that's your flux, um, then, then you can remember also that term for the, for the continuity equation. Okay, so we want to bring in um, the, uh, the MHD equations here, right? And so for the momentum term, the, the Lorentz force is what, what is um, applicable there. So that's where you get that uh, J cross B term. And, and of course, you can write everything down in terms of the electric field and the magnetic field, but actually it's much more convenient to remove the electric field term and just write um, things down um, where you have E equals V cross B over C. Uh, and then, then the current density can come in J, so J, J is the current density here, uh, and then you can relate um, J and, and V cross B, and that's essentially um, where, where in the, I'll just write down the momentum equation here so you can see it, uh, where in the momentum equation the J cross B term comes from. So I'll write it down here. J rho dv dt, right? And again, that can be written in two ways, two different terms. You have dv dt, plus you have your effective term. And then you can have the j cross b term and in, in CGS units, you'll have a C. And then, of course, you can have other terms like a pressure term. Um, and if you want to consider some non-ideal MHD terms, you could have gravity. This is gravity. Um, and you can also have some sort of uh, diffusion or stress tensor. But these would be non-ideal 
So the J cross B term, again, it comes from the Lorentz force, right, which, which makes a lot of sense because when you're writing down your momentum equation, you're really writing down a force equation. And so you need to, to consider all the terms that are acting on uh, to, to give you your, your final momentum. Um, right, so, so okay, the J cross B term is interesting because when you open up a paper on ideal MHD or if you, op you, you go to the archive and you look at some paper where they're using the ideal MHD equations. So a lot of times they don't go through all these different terms. And the first time you look at it uh, as a student, you're just like, okay, these, you solving these equations, so what? What do they all mean? Um, you know, what do all these terms mean? Uh, so these, I think, are intuitive, right? Pressure, gravity, and then you can have some effect of viscosity or stress. Um, but if you really expand out the J cross B term, you find two really interesting things. Um, and they both relate to what's called magnetic tension and magnetic pressure, right? So, so you can expand out this term here, and you can write it in terms of both this term here, so B dot grad B, which is the magnetic tension, and then the magnetic pressure term, right, which is a scalar term. Um, so what is magnetic pressure and magnetic tension? Well, magnetic pressure probably is somewhat intuitive, right, if you just think of pressure, so it's a pressure force from the magnetic field. Tension's less intuitive, perhaps, right? So tension, you can think of the magnetic field like rubber bands, right? So tension... Uh, tends to want to restore the, the curvature of the magnetic field, right? The topology of the magnetic field. So if you have a rubber band and I pull it taut and then I ask you to pull on it, you're going to feel the tension force of the rubber band wanting to restore itself back to straight. Um, so that's, that's an example of magnetic tension. Of course, pressure is basically... Just it's, it's just pressure. I think that one makes more sense. With magnetic fields, generally things aren't very intuitive, but imagine that you basically increase your magnetic field strength, right? That's effectively the same as kind of bunching the field lines more and more together. You're increasing B, and the magnetic pressure is proportional to B squared. So you're going to increase your magnetic pressure. So that's, that's essentially the meaning of the J cross B term, right? It's, it's breaking things down. You can break it down into... The, the force of the magnetic field due to both pressure and tension. All right, so of course there's also this pressure term, grad P, so it could be thermal pressure. Um, so it could be, yeah, thermal pressure or potentially some other sort of pressure terms. And that brings me to uh, an important parameter, right? So again, I mentioned these parameters like the Dubai length and the plasma frequency. Uh, the plasma beta is another important basic uh, MHD parameter that you'll see a lot, and that's the ratio, it's a dimensionless quantity, the ratio of, of the plasma pressure. So beta is the ratio of pressure, depending on your units here. I think I have 8 pi in the, yeah slide. Um, so beta is a very important parameter because it delimits different plasma regimes, right? So for example, if beta is very small, then that means your magnetic field is very large, so the magnetic field dominates the plasma properties, uh, and that has application for certain environments. So for example, the solar corona is a very low beta plasma. Um, you can also have uh, regimes in the interstellar medium where you have low beta plasmas. So for example of that would be um, the, the warm and cold neutral medium um, can often have beta less than one uh, in, in the interstellar medium. Um, so if beta is large, of course, that means the, the plasma pressure dominates, so the pressure force dominates. So for example, stellar interiors, that's definitely a very high beta regime. Um, and so, the, of course, the other limit is beta around 1, where both forces have to be taken into account. Um, okay, so, so that gives you some idea of uh, 
the momentum equation. Um, and of course, finally, we also just have to consider Right, so we have continuity, we have momentum, we have the uh, time variation of the magnetic field equation, um, and then we also have a div dot b is zero. So those are the basic ideal MHD equations that need to be satisfied if you want to, to solve them in a, in a particular numerical problem. Um, so these are, I've just listed a few properties of ideal MHD. So if you have those sorts of systems, Obviously, mass, momentum, and energy are conserved. I'm not going to talk about helicity and cross-helicity. I think that'll be discussed another day. But there's these very interesting um, uh, conservative properties in ideal MHD. And those are some of the terms that, that are conserved. Um, oh, and then the other thing is that ideal MHD is scale-free. So I, again, I'm not going to go into that too much today either, but just to say that you can actually rewrite all the, MA, the ideal MHD equations into a form where you have um, uh, basically unitless form, where everything is scale-free. And, and then you can do a lot of interesting things where you explore the wave properties of, of the equations. So for example, this very simple example I gave earlier, you see very clearly that you can develop waves in such a system, right? And so you can actually linearize the equations and then write down um, the basic uh, wave properties of the ideal MHD equations. Um, yeah, so there, there's a lot of very interesting um, and cute properties of ideal MHD. Um, so I want to mention, though, and I think this will be a, another um, important topic for a lot of the lectures, is uh, where, where do you have to consider the non-ideal MHD? Um, or how, how do you approach it, right? So when these equations fail you. Um, so there's a couple different approaches. So one is you can basically keep your MHD equations, your ideal MHD equations, but then do some extensions to them. Um, so you can add additional terms to your momentum equation here. Um, primarily, it's, it's done here, where you, uh, or, or the, how the magnetic field varies in time. Uh, you could also add it in there, which would extend your ideal MHD to include non-ideal MHD effects. Um, so for example, one example of that would be including resistive terms, right? So including some sort of explicit uh, uh, magnetic resistivity or plasma viscosity um, and include those in your equations directly and then, uh, you know, apply that to a particular problem. Um, another approach, which is actually a completely different approach, is to do uh, what's called ki uh, kinetic theory or, or particle and cell simulations. Um, and that's where you actually just abandon these equations altogether um, and you actually track individual particles or the indiv individual particle distribution functions. Um, or you do some hybrid approach of the, the kinetic theory with the fluid theory. So, so I just wanted to mention that you know, these equations are definitely, as I, as I think I've said many times now, they're not the end-all be-all. There's, in fact, many different interesting plasma approaches where you don't have to take these ideal uh, MHD um, approximations into account. In fact, there's many re uh, regimes where that would be the appropriate thing. Um, so actually, I think transitioning now to turbulence, I think that's where this is going here. Um, so one, one interesting um, application of ideal MHD is the so-called frozen end condition. Um, and that's where if you take, take your Ohm's law and combining it with Faraday's law, of course, then you get the equation for the, the variation with the magnetic field in time. And basically, when you have this frozen in condition, it suggests that when you have a particle of gas, it just sticks to the magnetic field line, and it's essentially stuck to that field line. And there's no movement of, of the fluid with, with uh, the magnetic field, right? So another way to say that is there's no change of the magnetic field line topology. Right, so the magnetic field and the fluid are just frozen in together, and they don't change around. Um, of course, that's not what we see in nature. Um, so 
Um, this, this is actually what's seen with the, um, uh, with, with the flares in the sun, right? So when we see a solar flare, actually we can literally follow the, the plasma along field lines and we can see that the, the field lines in a flaring event are actually changing their topology, right? We can even see it in real time. So it's one of the most like dramatic examples of the frozen in condition uh, in ideal MHD being violated, All right? So this, this has a name, of course, it's called reconnection. Um, and that's where you have some plasma flow along um, field lines, which have op opposite polarity, they're flowing in. Uh, the, the field lines then change their topology. And then you have an event like an explosion, basically, right? So you have uh, plasma, which is, is violently pushed out um, uh, basically uh, perpendicular to the direction that it was coming in. So this process is definitely an example of where this frozen in condition in ideal MHD is broken, right? This, this reconnection process. Um, so I think, again, this will be a topic for, for more detailed lectures, but actually I want to transition now to, to talking a little more about turbulence. Um, and I think the reason why this is a good transition uh, is because this is an example of a, a highly non-ideal effect, right? You, when you have this frozen in condition that's broken, right? So this is a violation of the ideal MHD equations that we actually take for granted all the time when we solve them in our numerical simulations, right? That, that on, on, let's say, on the smallest scales of the simulation, you always have some... Uh, violation of your ideal MHD equations, whether it's from the numerical viscosity, right? So numerical errors on the small scales. Um, and, you know, as Lewis mentioned earlier, the, the famous example of that is, is especially the violation of, of div dot B. You know, this, this is challenging because it's not like, you know, div dot B is, is like 0. 0.00000, like one machine, machine per, it's zero, right? It's zero. And when you start to, have it not be zero in your simulations, you start to propagate numerical errors, right? And this leads to violation of the ideal MHD equations. But like even more important than that is like I put my, the ideal MHD equations into a simulation, let's see, that's designed to study turbulence, right? And I force my momentum equation, right? So I set this equation to have some forcing term and I generate some fluctuations uh, in the density field, and then I develop turbulence in the simulation. So there's a lot of these simulations that are like, they're basically called turbulence in a box simulations. Um, and in those cases, we're also violating the ideal MHG equations, even though that's the equations we're solving, right? And, and in some sense, the reason for that is exactly this. And this is why I've picked this as the transition, because when you have a, a turbulent simulation, so, so like this simulation here, this is a, a little snapshot of a very generic 3D MHD simulation which, which solves the ideal MHD um, equations, you don't have these static magnetic field lines, right, that would be basically frozen into the fluid, right? In fact, what you see is you have these very turbulent field lines, right? So you have some, potentially you have some guide field set up in your simulation, where you have a mean field direction, and then you have some fluctuations, right, because you're driving the momentum equation. Well, you could have reconnection, right, because the field lines will touch each other, change their topology, and reconnect. So this is just an example of, of sort of a, a tricky, sticky problem that we have as numericists where we're violating the equations that we're solving, right? And we need to really think very carefully about how, how, we, how we really understand and model the ideal MHD equations and, and in what regimes are we uh, safe and in what regimes we're not safe to use them. And I would argue that uh, the situation of turbulence is actually already you're violating the, the, um, the flex freezing condition. So that's, that's, um, that's a tricky thing for ideal MHD. Okay, so I'm gonna transition to turbulence now. Um, and well, so, so yeah, so it's this big problem with ideal MHD and turbulence. It's not been, it's not a new problem, right? So there's been quite uh, 
a lot of challenges in the field of turbulence in general. So uh, going, I guess, all the way back um, hundreds and hundreds of years uh, to, to uh, Galileo, he was, he was investigating the properties of fluids. Um, but here's a quote from Heisenberg, so uh, not quite so long ago, but he, he even was sort of baffled by turbulence. This is a very famous quote that's attributed to him. When I meet God, I'm going to ask him two questions, why relativity and why turbulence? And I really believe he'll have an answer for the first. And actually, I like this quote so much because, you know, in the age of LIGO, it's really, we don't even have to ask God anymore about relativity, right? But like, for sure, turbulence is still the problem. And then this is a great one from Feynman. So he also called turbulence the most important unsolved problem in classical physics. Um, so, you know it's hard for Feynman. I think we're in trouble. Okay, so I'm not going to potentially get to all of these aspects of turbulence, um, but I want, so, so I know MHD will be talked about later in the, in the, um, in the lectures um, uh, the next couple weeks, uh, but I don't think turbulence is going to be touched upon too much, and so I want to give, again, some basic understanding of turbulence because it's actually very much linked to anything related to fluids, right? So when we talk about things like the hydrodynamic equations or the magnetohydrodynamic equations, if you really think about it, when we're talking about fluids, it's actually very difficult to keep fluids in a laminar state, right? So imagine the air in this room. There might be a few layers in which things are smooth, but as soon as you go near any of the air conditioning ducts, right, and they're, they're providing some momentum, you immediately transition to this swirls and eddies and chaotic behavior, right? Um, with actually very little, very little push on the fluid. And so it's actually very difficult to keep fluids in a laminar state. Um, and so whenever we talk about fluids, whether it's hydrodynamic or magnetohydrodynamic, whenever we talk about um, quiescent fluids, it's actually, I would say, a very special case right, that we're, we're considering, and that mostly we should be considering, especially as astrophysicists, we should be trying to consider and understand how the fluids are behaving in this turbulent regime. So, okay, so I will talk about a little bit about scaling laws. So Kolmogorov theory, um, again, maybe some of you have encountered that before, but I'll just go through it again. And, and then how, how that can be extended to include MHD, um, and, and shocks and various things that we know as astrophysicists we need to consider. Um, because uh, as I've kind of motivated at the very start of the lecture, the sort of fluids that we encounter in astrophysical situations are definitely magnetized. Sh they have shocks, so shocks are important, et cetera. Um, and then I might try to touch a little bit about how we measure them, but I think not too much. Um, okay, so back to our uh, momentum equation, our force equation. So how, first of all, how do we know that uh, fluids tend to be turbulent, right? So I already made that argument, but if we want to be a little more um, rigorous, we can again um, look at our momentum equation, and we have um, dvdt. We could break this down into two terms. And if you take the ratio of, of these two terms, um, the inertial and, and viscous terms here, the ratio of that is something called the Reynolds number. And the Reynolds number is a very common um, dimensionalist parameter that people use when they talk about a, tra a transition to turbulence, right? So a transition meaning you go from this very smooth kind of flow situation where like you'd have like a, a flow just to go back to my pipe here, a flow moving smoothly down the pipe, and then at some point, maybe the, the pipe changes again, the fluid moves very fast, and then it starts to transition to turbulence, right? So this would be the relevant parameter here, the Reynolds number, so it's the ratio of the velocity and length scale. So the length scale in this case of my pipe would be L here. The viscosity is the fluid viscosity, and the velocity is the, the characteristic velocity of the fluid. Um, so there's no, there's no um, 
definite number for the Reynolds number that says like above this number, thou shalt be turbulent and below this number, you will be laminar. Very much also depends on the geometry of the system. Um, but basically Reynolds numbers of greater than 10 to the three, 10 to the four, it's gonna be very difficult for that fluid to remain in a smooth laminar flow. It's gonna transition into these eddies and swirls. Now, you can pretty easily take numbers for the viscosity, the velocity, and the length scale of astrophysical objects and plug them in, and you very quickly realize, like, oh, man, the Reynolds numbers are going to be, like, 10 to the 10, 10 to the 8, maybe higher, 10 to the 12, something large, definitely larger than any um, sort of laminar expectations that we have. So the, even just this back of the envelope calculation from the momentum equation, you can see um, that these, this should be definitely uh, applicable in astrophysics, this turbulence. Um, so, you know, I've already mentioned what is turbulence in the sense of eddies. Um, these are, oh, this is from da Vinci. Yeah, these are drawings here. Uh, so when I said turbulence has been studied for hundreds of years, like you can really see da Vinci was thinking about this, right? He's drawing the flow around a bridge. He's drawing um, like a, a, a little waterfall here, or a flow where it's developing into all these eddies and swirls, right? So, so one way of thinking of turbulence, right? And this has been maybe the, the longest way of studying it is in terms of this uh, sort of uh, structure, structural method, right? It's where you see, oh, okay, you have these eddies. They, they develop these swirls, uh, and then you have this, these particular characteristic structures. Um, and then I like, I think this is cute. I studied Latin uh, in college. So the word turbulence comes from the Latin, right? Tur turba. And this, this is actually the disordered motion of a crowd, right? So this, um, that's just where the word comes from. I think it's great. Uh, Reynolds number, I already mentioned that. Um, just an interesting point here about the reason why you see people riding uh, these reclining bikes. The reason for that, again, is the Reynolds number, right? Because you're reducing, you're reducing your size here, right? So for the same velocity and viscosity, you actually reduce uh, your drag and, and the turbulent flow behind you. And so it ends up being a more efficient way of riding a bike. Probably not in New York. It's probably pretty dangerous. Don't recommend riding a bike here. <laughs> um, just a few more examples. I want to get to this, though, right? Because I already mentioned this... Um, sort of structural understanding of turbulence, right? So that was da Vinci was starting with. Um, why isn't this a good way of trying to understand turbulence, right? So this is something actually we all have some intuition for, right? Because we're, you know, either we've been swimming or we've been canoeing or we've, we've watched, you know, when we create eddies and turbulent flows, how these eddies are structured, right? And you might have noticed, or I, I encourage you to go notice, when you create turbulence, you often start with these eddies on the largest scale of the system, right? So, for example, with canoeing, if you move the canoe back, you'll notice these eddies basically are starting um, to form roughly at the length scale of your paddle, right? So you can form bigger eddies or smaller eddies. Um, but so you can, you can really study how the structures of the turbulent flow change, right, on, on a very fundamental level. Well, that's fine, except... As physicists, what are we going to do with that, right? So we, we need some formal theory. We need to write down the, you know, Navier-Stokes equations, the hydrodynamic equations, or the MHD equations, and then understand turbulence in the context of, of uh, you know, the, the, the basic fundamental equations. So any sort of structural theory, obviously, isn't going to really help us do that. There's another method people have used to study turbulence, right? And again... Turbulence is still an unsolved problem. So this is like how people are going about studying it. Um, so that's through statistics, right? And I'll definitely, I'll touch a little more about that in the remaining time. You know, if we want to discuss uh, the, the characteristics of the flow, right? In the pipe, for example, and I see, okay, I have large eddies here, but then they break into smaller ones and smaller ones. And I can see that structurally, 
Now I can study it statistically by saying, oh, well, maybe if we take um, a structure function or a Fourier transform, or we study how the flow changes with time, you know, then we can write down some statistical description of the flow. And actually that has been fairly successful uh, in understanding that turbulence isn't just, isn't just randomness. Um, and, I, and I'll touch on that in just a second. However, of course, that has a lot of problems in a sense, because again, we're not going back to the fundamental equations, right? And so ultimately we want some sort of deterministic approach where we are able to solve turbulence directly from solutions to the Navier-Stokes equations or the MHD equations. That has been really, when people say turbulence is an unsolved problem, that's what they're really referring to. They're referring to the fact that there's actually no solution to the Navier-Stokes equations uh, in the limit of large Reynolds number. Um, there have been some solutions in two dimensions, but in the full three dimensions, uh, there, hasn't been, there hasn't been any solution to that. And so that's been the challenge of turbulence. And then just you know, forget MHD, like you can't even do this in hydro. Um, so yeah, you want to eventually solve these equations um, and do it uh, in the limit of high Reynolds number, so basically in the, in the limit of large velocity or size scale. Um, or low viscosity. So this is so it's, it's this this field is challenging to the point where um, even just asking what is turbulence, right? To just define turbulence is a tricky thing to do. Um, so just an example of that, I was at a conference, uh, and we're actually having another conference like this here in December, where the the conference is bringing together researchers from astrophysics, from mathematics from engineering uh, and, and biology. And the topic is, is turbulence, and it's kind of bringing together all these different scales and perspectives, right? And the, the, whole, the goal of this meeting um, is to see what we can all learn from each other. Um, and then I was at a similar meeting, and the final discussion question of the meeting was what is turbulence? Can you imagine? Like we've had a week of of meeting, and the final question is what is turbulence? It sort of it sort of depressed me a little bit because then of course we all argued for two hours about what is turbulence. We have engineers and mathematicians, and so so this is actually my definition that I submitted. Um, and again, this brings more of this this um, statistical picture in, right? So I mentioned these three ways. The, the direct um, uh, numerical approach or the direct solving of, of the equations, statistics, and, and structure, right? So engineers often look more structurally. Uh, as an astrophysicist, I think it's useful to look statistically, right? Because when you look at the flow statistically, you actually start to pick out regularities, right? And with regularities, we can start to, to make, at least a, in a phenomenological way, uh, a theoretical approach to the topic of turbulence, right? And especially in something like astrophysics, where we don't have the luxury of making direct measurements, uh, statistics are extremely important. But the point here is that turbulence isn't just chaos. So when you look statistically, you see when you average quantities like velocity and density and magnetic field, when you average those things spatially and temporally, you see regularities, right? So it's not just chaos. Uh, and that's very useful, right, for, for studying turbulence. So, so when I say statistics, that can mean any number of things, right? So I would say most um, traditionally the statistic for turbulence has been uh, what's called the, the Fourier power spectrum, right, where you'd simply take a uh, Fourier transform of, let's say, the velocity field, um, the magnetic energy, whatever, whatever quantity you're studying, and then you take the amplitude, right? And you, you throw away the phases. Um, and then if you have a multidimensional field, you might need to do some averaging. But you average the amplitude. So that's the Fourier amplitude here. This is, of course, just a cartoon, but just to illustrate the point. And then on your x-axis, you would have either frequency, if you were looking at a temporal signal. Uh, or if you're looking at a, a spatial field, you would have the wave number. Right? So this. This is, says wave number here, so this is inverse of the, the spatial scale. 
Um, and so why is the Fourier power spectrum so useful for turbulence? And if you read, um, so for example, if you look at this book or some of the other many books on turbulence and MHD turbulence, um, you will very quickly start to see power spectra or related quantities like the correlation function or the structure function. Um, but basically, the reason why that's so important is because you see the basic patterns of the turbulent flow, right? And so those patterns are identifying particular interesting features in the flow. So since this is a spatial power spectrum, what is this telling you? It's telling you something about the scale at which energy is being injected into the system. And then what we call turbulence is actually this self-similarity. So you have this what's called an inertial range. Uh, in the turbulent cascade, where you see this power law-like behavior. And then there's, at some smaller scales, a dissipation range, where, where your energy becomes very, very low and dissipates. And the dissipation can either be from heat or shocks, um, or just the fluid viscosity can, can all provide dissipation. Um, and so this, this simple statistic really encapsulates a lot of the features of the turbulent flow. right? So you have some injection of energy. Then you have some cascade, right, where you cascade from large scale structures to smaller and smaller scale structures. You can think of these as eddies, right, breaking into smaller and smaller eddies. And that's why, because it's self similar, you get this nice power law. And then the dissipation. So this is why the statistical approach is actually very powerful, right? We don't, we don't need to understand how turbulence is entering our fluid equations in this picture, although we would certainly like to. What we can just say is like, okay, we know this is turbulence. We see it structurally. We then study it statistically, and oh wow, these interesting regularities in a very chaotic-looking flow appear. And this is why it's useful for astrophysics. Um, yeah. So about the power spectrum, I want to get to that. Yeah. Okay, Kolmogorov, Kolmogorov power spectrum. So just on the topic of of this. Inertial range, right? So, so of course, like if you think of the injection of energy, that can change for different systems, right? So you could have, um, you know, a supernova that goes off and expands a bubble, and that bubble can drive turbulence out to, let's say, even hundreds of parsec scales, or maybe even kiloparsec scales. Or, you know, I can like wave my arms around up here, and I can drive turbulence roughly on the length scale of my arm. Right. So that means the driving scale, of course, is dependent on what sort of physical process is driving it and what, what length scale that happens at. Same with the dissipation range, but the beautiful thing is the inertial range in both those systems, because it's self-similar, actually can have the same scaling. Right? So that power law can be, can be similar despite the fact that uh, I am much smaller than a supernova. Um, the, the, it's, it's a scale-free process. And uh, there was a very famous paper in 1941 by Kolmogorov, where he, just from very simple dimensional analysis arguments, um, derived this scaling relation of the power spectrum. So that's the E of K. This is the spatial power spectrum. Uh, how, how would that power law um, behavior scale? So all you have to do to derive this result is say, well, OK, I'm going to have conservation of energy. So my energy per time is going to be constant. Um, and, and then I can just simply write down the energy density, uh, the, the, the wave number, so that's the inverse of the length, um, and, and my power spectrum. Right? So I can write down all the units. And the only possible combination that, that gives all the right dimensions for length and time uh, is this k to the minus 5 thirds. Okay, so that's, that's the simple result that Kolmogorov uh, came to. So it's really just based on the on dimensional analysis. Um, the thing to note here, so you'll see the Kolmogorov scaling in textbooks, and you'll, of course, even see it um, referenced all the time if you start to dig into the astrophysical turbulence literature. Um, oftentimes, people will make measurements of the power spectrum uh, or the correlation function. Um, and then relate the slope they find back to something like the Kolmogorov slope, right? this 5 thirds scaling law. Um, the important thing to keep in mind with that is that um, this is for sort of incompressible fluids, 
unmagnetized fluids. So this is not for situations with shocks. Uh, and it's also uh, not applicable for situations with low plasma beta, right? So for strong magnetic fields. Um, there you have to consider very different scalings for the, um, or, or different physics is involved uh, in this sort of uh, scaling. So, okay, let's talk about that. So if we want to stick with this statistical description of turbulence and again, bringing, bringing it full circle back to MHD, um, what should we consider? Well, the things that were not included in the Kolmogorov scaling, of course, as I just mentioned, are any sort of uh, compressibility, right? Where you can have changes in the density um, in the density field. Um, so for example, shocks, right? So the jump conditions that you guys saw yesterday um, those, those would be uh, the case of compressible turbulence, right? So just real life examples, air, right, being compressible, uh, water being incompressible. Um, so how does this Kolmogorov picture change uh, when we talk about a compressible medium? Um, so one interesting or one important parameter to think about with compressibility is, of course, as, as was mentioned yesterday, the sonic Mach number. Um, so this is the ratio of the flow velocity to the sound speed. So Vs here is the sound speed. Uh, and Vl would be your characteristic uh, fluid flow. So low Mach number is basically the limit of incompressibility, high Mach number being a compressible fluid. And so what happens to the power spectrum, actually, it, there's, first of all, there's no real solid model for what happens to a, a, a fluid with, with uh, shocks. Um, what can happen in terms of velocity is not so dramatic. Um, so this is, these are numerical simulations, um, MHD simulations where the ideal MHD uh, equations are solved with an isothermal equation of state, and we can then vary the sonic Mach number. Uh, and, and that's what all these different lines here are, uh, if you can see this. So these are different, different Mach numbers uh, from different simulation runs. So basically, the velocity doesn't really change very much, right? So you get this, this spectrum. You know, maybe there's something happening here, but probably that's already in the dissipation range. Um, so it's roughly five-thirds. But the density power spectrum, of course, naturally uh, changes quite dramatically. So in the limit of the incompressible, yeah. So this is the fluid velocity, right? So when I solve my ideal MHD equations, I get a, a vector of velocity, magnetic field, and then I get density as a scalar, right? So I get all these fields. So, so the velocity here is the, the velocity field. So that remains roughly Kolmogorov. Um, and the density, you know, in the incompressible limit should follow the velocity like a passive scalar. However, when we're compressible, meaning we have shocks, the turbulent power spectrum looks very different, right? So again, these are all different lines of different sonic Mach numbers. And uh, the solid line here on the top is the most supersonic simulation. This is a Mach number of seven. Uh, and you can see it's significantly flatter than, than the uh, five-thirds scaling. Um, and I think you can understand that almost intuitively, again, like thinking the structural approach to turbulence. So imagine what is a shock doing to the fluid, right? You're building up density, right? So if this is density, you start to pile up high-density regions in your simulation, right? So this is rho, this is mean rho, and you, you get an, a, a jump in rho, at least in the isothermal limit, that's Mach squared. So you're increasing density contrast, and what that does to your power, if you think of this in terms of amplitude or power, is that when you increase the Mach number, you start to increase uh, especially at the small scales, the, the density contrast. <clears throat> and so that's why you should naturally expect the power to increase as you increase the sonic Mach number. Um, okay, fine. 
that's great. So, you know, Kolmogorov obviously fails in, in this particular compressible limit. But one interesting aspect of that is that, oh, well, this maybe means that we could use the power spectrum as a statistic to study shocks in the interstellar medium, right? Because we know that we should have this very strong dependence, uh, the flattening of the power spectrum uh, when we go to higher and higher compressibility, right? So this, is, this has actually been a tool for people to study shocks in the ISM because we have this, this really interesting behavior with Mach number, among other different types of statistics as well. So how would we do that? Well, we could, of course, just take a map of some region or a galaxy and, and compute the power spectrum and see how that looks. But then we would want to compare it with something, right? So, so this has actually been done in, in the SMC, which is a local dwarf galaxy. Uh, it can actually be seen with the naked eye from the southern hemisphere, um, which is really cool because you can actually see another galaxy. Um, and so you can measure the sonic Mach number from statistics like the power spectrum um, or the distribution of densities. So that's like, for example, here, this would be the density distribution with different uh, higher order moments. You could also do this with the power spectrum. And then this histogram here is actually the directly measured sonic Mach number from observational data. So in this case, the sonic Mach number uh, has been measured in an observational survey of the 21 centimeter line, which is neutral hydrogen. Uh, and so basically you can directly measure the sound speed and the, uh, the turbulent velocity dispersion. So in, in effect, this means just the non-thermal velocity dispersion uh, and make an estimate of the sonic Mach number uh, in these regions in the SMC. And so the statistical approach has, has actually been found to agree pretty well with, with completely observational approach to measuring sonic Mach number. So just to say that these things look actually pretty reasonable when you compare them. Okay, what else? Yeah, I think, I think I mentioned this already. So when talking about the power spectrum, um, it's often very tempting to compare uh, simulations and the, the measured spectral scaling in the simulations to our theoretical predictions, right? And many a bloody battle has been fought over the slope, the scaling slope of the power spectrum, uh, even in incompressible turbulence, so incompressible MHD. Um, so this is a word of caution is that our numerical simulations have actually a very difficult time of properly resolving this inertial range, right? Where you have a prediction like the Kolmogorov scaling or maybe some other scaling law. You know, really our astrophysical systems or the solar wind, we have an, actually an enormous dynamic range, right? Over, let's say this is a length scale, right? We have many, many orders of magnitude of scale over which we should potentially expect to have this turbulent cascade, right? Just based on a, the Reynolds number argument I gave you earlier. Of course, in the simulations, we have very limited range of scales, right? And that's just because we, we, we don't have enough uh, resolution, numerical uh, power, uh, memory, whatever it is to do a simulation where we really can resolve all these uh, ranges of scales. So a lot of times it's actually very difficult to measure the inertial range and, and, and compare it to theoretical predictions. So this has been a bit of a challenge. Um, so after the lecture, um, you know, after the break, we're going to come back and we're going to do some practical examples. Um, and Lewis and I both have uh, prepared different ones, so you can pick one. And the one I'm going to give you guys is to actually download a time series and make a measurement of the power spectrum, right? And compare that to the Kolmogorov scaling. And, and you can see if you can convince yourself, is it really, what, what is the spectral slope, right, in the time series? Um, can you actually really measure the true dynamic range uh, spectral scaling slope? So this is, a, this is an ongoing challenge in this field. Um, 
let's see. Okay, so now now I want to transition in like the next just 10 minutes uh, talking about the effects of the magnetic field on on this turbulent scaling picture. So I've already mentioned the, the Mach number, right? So definitely there's a big change to the density statistics of turbulence. In this case, I'm only talking about the power spectrum. Um, now, what about the magnetic field? So the relevant parameter, so like if you just think in terms of the dimensionless parameters, right? we have the Mach number, which basically characterizes the density jumps. Um, especially in the isothermal limit, it really nicely characterizes how much density contrast should we, should we expect. Um, there's another dimensionless parameter. It's called the Alphane Mach number. And it depends on something called uh, the Alphane velocity. Let me see, how did I? Yeah, so just, just keeping the right units here. Yeah, so the Alphane velocity depends on the magnetic field depends on the number of particles and the mass. So these could be ions or electrons. You could also rewrite this, of course, in terms of density. Um, so this alphane velocity is the speed um, at which waves are traveling along the magnetic field lines. Um, and, and waves. Um, of some that are produced by some particle with a particular mass. Of course, protons and electrons will be different in this case. And, and the, the waves are then given by the restoring force, which of course is the magnetic field. Right? So there's waves moving along the, the, the field line. So this is the speed of those waves, where the restoring force is, is the magnetic field. So why is the Alphane Mach number an important parameter? Um, so you can think of this in terms of energy ratios. It's the ratio of the turbulent energy to the magnetic energy. Um, and you know, the analogy, of course, then is with the plasma beta that I mentioned earlier. Right? So the plasma beta being the ratio of the plasma pressure to the magnetic pressure. The Alphane Mach number is then the ratio of the turbulent energy density to the magnetic energy density. OK. Um, so that's, that's, that starts to bring into into play all the, the effects of the magnetic field on our turbulent flow. Because now we're not just talking about the ratio of the thermal pressure and the magnetic pressure, or the shocks, right, which is the ratio of the turbulent energy to the thermal energy, but now the magnetic field comes into play. So what does the magnetic field do to, to the uh, plasma properties? Well, basically, I've already drawn you a little picture here, and perhaps you could could already imagine in your in your picture of turbulence, right? Where you have these eddies, these swirls, uh, they end up being very isotropic, right? And like, go home and 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 stir around some water and watch the water move. You know, put some dye in it as a tracer, and you very quickly see, oh yeah, it looks it looks reasonably isotropic, like circular, right? These these eddy flows. But when you introduce a magnetic field, you introduce the waves, right, propagating along the magnetic field. You introduce magnetic pressure, magnetic tension, and there's all sorts of very interesting properties that happen in an MHD turbulent flow that are both eddy-like and wave-like. There's actually two now two regimes of the turbulence when you introduce the MHD effects. One is wave-like, Right, so again, this being the characteristic velocity of a wave moving along the magnetic field, yeah. Oh, yeah, you're right. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Um, uh, but you also induce interesting eddy-like motion, right? So you have waves and you have you have eddies. Um, and what happens to the eddies, uh, and, there's, and there's actually very interesting limits where these two things happen. I won't be able to get into that. But the eddies, of course, just start to um, uh, behave in an in a anisotropic way. right? So instead of these nice circular eddies, you have uh, eddies which are elongated along the magnetic field. And let's see. <laughs> 
yeah, so I'm sorry I'm, I'm speaking faster than I'm, I'm changing my slides here. Um, and so in, the, in this wave-like regime, right? So now, now I'm only speaking about incompressible turbulence, right? So this is actually not compressible. In this wave-like regime, right, we have the restoring force set by the, the magnetic field. Um, and then you can imagine you have these waves moving along and interacting. Right, so in, in, the, in the picture, you have what's called a wave packet, right? These two waves can interact and collide. Um, this is also in the literature called weak turbulence. It doesn't mean uh, the, the turbulence is, um, you know, the amplitude of the turbulence is low. It means the, the strength of the nonlinear interactions is, is weak. That's the way to think about it. Okay, so we can imagine these, these wave motions moving along the alphane uh, velocity, and they collide with each other, so they move together. And, and you can think of each of them carrying a particular energy, right, moving along at the alphane speed, uh, along the magnetic field line. And they have some link scale, because they're not entirely uh, isotropic, right, because they're stretched slightly along the magnetic field. So there is a parallel direction to the magnetic field and then there's the perpendicular direction, right? Because now we have to, to divide these, these uh, motions into relative parallel and perpendicular since we're no longer in this isotropic limit. Okay, so what happens when they collide? Well, they, of course, cascade. So you have two large packets. They go down uh, wave packets. They cascade and they collide. They exchange energy and then they break up into smaller and smaller packets, right? This is the idea of turbulence being uh, cascading. Um, and so this is the basic picture uh, behind what's called the, the critical balance condition, where you compare uh, the magnetic energy to turbulent energy uh, and, and these length scales uh, and, 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 uh, in the cascade. And so you can basically derive a condition which relates the uh, two different scales, so the parallel and perpendicular scaling, uh, and, and, and the cascade rate, and the cascading scaling. So, so the idea here is what, uh, what is um, this ratio of link scales as a function of the cascade, right? In addition to what is the power spectral scaling, right? That's, that's really the question that, that we're trying to, to address when we talk about uh, this weak versus strong uh, limit in, in the MHD uh, regime. Um, and so to derive this, what you want to do is relate um, the, basically the eddy turnover time, right? So that's the V here, that's your turbulent velocity, and the perpendicular link scale uh, to, to the alphane uh, uh, time scale. Uh, and that's, that gives you what's called the critical balance. So that's a, a very famous result that's derived in Goldrick Sridhar in 1995, um, where those two things um, are, are equal, th those two time scales. Um, and so then you derive the cascade uh, scaling, right? So similar, actually, the interesting thing is similar to Kolmogorov, this perpendicular scaling, right? So again, the perpendicular uh, length scale is, is relative to the magnetic field, perpendicular to the magnetic field. Uh, this goes as k to the minus 5 thirds. Um, and then you also derive a scaling here of the parallel and perpendicular length scale. So the parallel uh, scaling goes like the perpendicular scaling to the 2 thirds. Okay, so what, what does that mean? What that means is you have stretching, right, the anisotropy of the eddies, but not only do you have that, it's actually scale dependent, right? That's what, that's what this, this um, relationship means. So as you go further and further down the cascade, magnetic energy is actually becoming more dominant than the kinetic energy, and the eddies then begin to become more and more elongated. So that's the, um, the so-called scale dependent anisotropy. And that's one of the main... Uh, and important effects of the magnetic field on uh, the ideal MHD uh, turbulence in the incompressible limit is that you you now expect not only to have this self-similarity 
uh, which is perpendicular, but you have the scale dependent and isotropy, which relates the, the structures in the parallel and perpendicular direction. Um, so I think I'll stop there and take questions before we have a break and then do the, um, the practical session. Does anyone have more questions? Yeah. Yeah, or heat or shocks or, yeah. Um, oh, that's a really good question. So, so that actually um, brings into play a lot of the non-ideal effects uh, that I mentioned would potentially be important but didn't go into them. Um, so, so one important one for the example I've cited a few times, which is star formation, uh, would be the fact that you, you actually have partially ionized medium. And so the dominant or most likely one of the dominant dissipation processes um, when you have ions and neutrals treated separately would be ion neutral friction. Um, because you have some regime where you have strong collisional coupling between ions and neutrals, and even in the case of very low ionization fraction, so low being like 10 to the minus 6 or something, um, so, so very low ionization fraction, you can still have strong collisional coupling between neutrals and ions to the point where the neutrals will basically behave like, a, like an ideal MHD fluid um, through collisional coupling. So they'll feel the magnetic effects, tension and stress and whatever... Um, pressure through, through collisions with, with the ions. But there's a scale, and you can derive that scale, it's, it's called the ambipolar diffusion scale, where they basically um, are no longer strongly collisionally coupled. They're no longer coupled through collisions. And then you start to introduce um, uh, drag, and then that very quickly damps your cascade. So that would be one situation where you know, including MHD effects can, can damp the cascade. Uh, whereas if you only considered the neutrals, you wouldn't have that effect. Yes, yes, um, right. So if you have, um, so let's take the limit of large alpha and Mach number, right? So right. So this is basically, you, you could take the total velocity, um, but it's basically the turbulent velocity in this case. Um, so if you have large alpha and Mach number, what that means is that the turbulent energy dominates over the magnetic energy. That's essentially what, what that, that's implying. Um, in that case, you'll start the cascade basically looking isotropic, right? Um, so the Kolmogorov scaling might be, you know, even the, the most, um, if it's incompressible, you'll see this five-thirds scaling. However... If you fully resolve your cascade, so say you have a ton of dynamic range, you would see in your simulation a transition at some point um, to subalphenic, right? So, so basically, you know, as you're moving down the cascade, your alpha and Mach number could be changing, right? Because this V could be local, a local V, right? So as you're moving down the cascade, kinetic energy is getting smaller and smaller, and you could reach a point where this becomes subalphenic. The magnetic field then dominates the dynamics, you have um, anisotropy in the eddies, uh, and then you'll, you'll, you can get this critical balance condition. Yeah. Um, so in the case of uh, the opposite case, right, where you're subalphenic, then you actually already start with the magnetic field basically dominating the dynamics of the flow. And again, that, that has different statistical properties than the superalphenic case. Um, yeah, so the, let's see, the wave-dominated regime actually starts subalphenic, 
I think. I'm actually, there's a couple different criteria for it. Do you remember, Sasha? The wave versus Eddie? No? Okay. <laughs> Waves can still burn as a result of the when it, the burn it becomes stronger to the square. Yeah. So it's a loosely defined term for any square. Yeah. Um, so yeah. So weak and strong definitely are, are related to the strength of the nonlinear interactions. Um, yeah, and then the alpha and Mach number plays a role in that. So at more eddy-like, more nonlinear would be more super alphanic, I think. Than yeah. Yeah, exactly. Because the magnetic field basically is is strong enough to where the 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 dynamics are are, are dominated by the wave motion. Okay, well, I'll be around if there's more questions, but I think it's break time. <laughs>